it's very fascinating for me to reset the idea of what a painting can be. You know, it's not like a formal issue only about volume and color, but it's also how could painting appear in this public space? The surface is very rough and clunky, and I do something like a watercolor on top, which is quite bizarre. So it's actually a very intimate uh, kind of painting, but just on a very large scale. So it's as if you're thinking out aloud. That's a little bit how I work. And what comes up in the end is a volume floating through this forest. I saw the space and had immediately the feeling it could be very, very interesting to work with the trees, to make the trees a very significant part of the overall image that would come about. And I'm very fascinated by the power of these iconic images, like the tree, the soil, the landscape. The trees are so strict, like little soldiers in that park. And I thought if I could place something in between the trees that looks like gigantic driftwood that has come and swept in with some sort of power that we can't explain, but now it's there. It has to look like it's been crumbled. Somebody, some big person has just dropped it. The sheer presence of these things of different size makes us think of something that must have happened, but we can't quite say what it is. The trees are very fragile and small, but yet they are taller than the work. The trees also give a certain scale to my work. The buildings around them are quite big, and that's a big challenge for um, outdoor work. One thing here with yeah. number nine. There's a big team effort needed to do these large sculptural works, especially for Metro Tech. Yes. So there is like an. Under that was the biggest piece I've done ever. 18 pieces we needed to produce in a relatively short amount of time. Hanging over the footpath. I made models and then we discussed it via Skype. Emeril had to make these works, laminate them, make them durable and hard with fiberglass and resin. Yeah, it could be like this. We needed people to handle it, to prime it, to get it into place, to understand how the pieces would work together. But it is far easier for me and efficient if they would be put together, at least like three or four of them, and then pile up to the whole pile. And if we could start with a small pile. OK. We start with 18 cutting first, and then we cut um, 16 and 17. No? I'm really happy with how the pieces look. That looks good. Yeah, yeah. chunky and Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. They're much bigger than we, I mean, we were pinning yesterday out the um, outline of the whole piece yeah. with um, pink ribbons. Yeah. <laughs> and it looked like so, sh 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 no, <laughs> through the woods, but it's, it's going to be, be substantial. Yeah, it's going to be substantial. Oh, yes. I might even go a little deeper. See how we can see right through the piece? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, they marked out the cuts, but it's just a hair overlapped. Mm -hmm. So when they did that, they ended up, they think, with a hole. So that middle. Matter. Yeah, it's not, it's not a problem. OK. I started to work with my brother three years ago. He is an engineer. It's the first time I have somebody in my team who is not coming from an art context. He joined us when I was doing a huge project for the temporary Kunsthalle in Berlin, where we constructed ellipses that were leaning against walls, and the ellipses were about 30 feet high. We had to work with a boat builder and a structural engineer, putting them together and hoisting them into place. That was a great moment. He has a really great way to connect the theoretical thinking that's needed to understand the engineering process, and he knows the language and all the words. And then he can still come back to me at the end of the day and say, look, we need that kind of bolt here. Yeah. Nein. No, 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 no. Das, das hier. We were very, very close when we were kids. He grew into an indispensable member of my team.
My parents took us to a lot of things when we were small. I was seeing paintings, drawings. We would also go to the theater a lot. So both my parents were very influential in that respect. My mother would draw and paint, but also um, cook and bring us to music lessons. And she didn't label herself artist. I started to tell myself that I actually had a mother who was an artist. She was the one to find out that I maybe had visual talent. One morning I had done a little watercolor. I had copied a black and white photograph from a newspaper. She thought it was amazing. She urged me to go on. My mom would also make us paint the garage walls. She would gather all the kids and say, let's make little drawings and see what the big picture could be like. It was a natural thing to paint things. My work is not idea-based, it's really thought-based. The thought is a more fluid field that gets feedback and is being changed while I do what I do. So there is an overall agreement that I have with myself as I start something. That agreement is based on a judgment. For example, I want to have two elements coincide that exclude one another. How could that work in that painting? or in that situation that I have in a gallery with a certain architectural setup. As I work, as I use my painting tools and colors, then I'm getting an instantaneous feedback by the materialization of that first agreement that might then change the relationship I have with the agreement. All these notions, the further steps that are changing again and again, that is that thought process that I find infinitely interesting. And that can't be fixed and written down as I start. I wanted to do something for the Nasher that was not a sculpture and that was not really using the space as a display space. There are two very large glass panels and the rest is just walls and you could move through this. So you had this vista through the building into the garden and in the garden were plants and sculptures that looked a little bit alike. How do you actually make yourself visible in that situation? Something like negative space coinciding with super large paint movements. Quite amazing that my invitation to a sculpture museum coincides with a moment where I wanted to do the negative space of volume with a painting sitting on top of that negative space. That is a fantastic confrontation of these two thoughts. I started to see that experiment is something that would just sit in the space as if it was taken out of the box and discarded. So I did not want the piece in relationship to other things. I just wanted to have it leaning against a wall so that it would sit exactly where the wall and the floor meet and that kind of joint would be then covered by the thing that I do. So you, you can't really tell the floor and the wall apart anymore because they are in terms of color very close in the Nasher with the limestone and the floor. And I did something for them that would move out of the space as well. So I wanted something that was inside and was going outside behind the glass panel. This is the 
Kunsthaus in Graz in Austria, and it's an amazing building. It's a bubble, it's a very organic shape. And I'm going to do a show there which has to do with one of my core questions, how can painting appear in space and what do I need to show the painting? I don't want to put walls in the space that then enable me to show canvases. The metal cage is the roof. We made it this way so that I can work in the space from above. These styrofoam blocks are solid walls that I could also possibly paint on. Other than the styrofoam blocks, I have no walls that define the space. There are no windows except these openings in the ceiling where I have lights. So I'm using canvas or some very thick cloth, maybe some sort of um, sail cloth and I want to crumple it, and at times I want to make a painting on that surface, and at other times you can just walk on the canvas or can walk through the exhibition. The painting process is all going to be done on site. We're trying to find out how can I build these creases and these folds to scale, because I find the space that is coming about by folding things quite interesting. I like that you are walking in a structure that is difficult to see as a whole. I'm really fascinated by that condition of us being in something and at the same time looking at it. I think that's the condition we have all the time. That has a lot to do with scale. I think that we are able to think so big and at the same time we're actually quite small in relationship to what is around us. So you're constantly changing in size as you walk through. The scale shift in this exhibition is really um, something that I'm very interested in. That, that is also what I thought was in Nasher so fascinating. The dirt room downstairs was the only space that didn't have any relationship to the outside garden. And upstairs I had the more analytical piece that was actually confronted with, with the garden and the plants and so on. I'm very adventuresome. <laughs> I grew up hiking and climbing in the mountains. Later on, I started to be very fascinated with the space that you encounter in landscape and in painting a landscape, because you're sitting somewhere vast and you have this 360 degree angle around you. And then you start to think, is there an order? What do I perceive? And how do I actually design an order for what I'm surrounded by? Landscape is an unbureaucratic space. The hierarchic shift is so fast in landscape. Something that was useful a minute ago turns out to be not so interesting two steps further to the right, for example. So there is a very unstable, very fluid sense for hierarchy in landscape. I'm really curious to know how the idea about the piece came up and uh, where you got your inspiration from. Everybody knows a tree, one way or another. You go into the park or into the woods. Something has happened to the trees. We don't know what it is, but they're not where they normally are. I love what happens to this material and to this image when it's painted, that mm -hmm. it turns into something else something that's not the tree, and at the same time, it's a tree. <laughs> and I love this paradox. So that's where the title originates also? Yeah, yeah, you don't uh, really know. Yeah. You see something far away, and then you think, oh, uh, that's, that looks like a bird. Mm -hmm. And then you come close, and it's a plastic bag. Mm -hmm. And I think this kind of ambiguity is there all the time. Was it the first time that you have been working with this kind of material? With the tree, with yeah. The tree? I was starting to be interested in this whole tradition of the painted sculpture mm -hmm. or the painted 3D thing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and I've used a couple of these things that are so strong, like the dirt or the soil, that is so important to our life. The roots are really amazing. Mm -hmm. as a structure, as all of a sudden this linear thing splits. So you had a few pieces, how did you put them together? You can see, here's the cut. That's the tree, this one was put together, so it's mm -hmm. all fiction. 
once you're starting to feel, ah, oh, that's a real tree, you see the cut. It's more like an edited tree. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And how did you choose the colors? It has to do with the, um, the light that you have in the space. The space is mm. quite dark. Mm. So I wanted to have something that reflects as well. So the yellow was uh, important for me. The yellow in front of here does something totally different than the yellow behind the roots, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Because right. there it kind of glows. Yeah. The colors I use are so raw, they are not mm -hmm. mixed. I like this raw, direct thing that they have with your body. It's like voice, like the voice of a singer, I think. That's what color yeah. very much has. Yeah, you had a lot to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had a lot to say. Yeah, yeah. All the blocks form one large canvas. Now that Katarina has painted, we need to put that canvas back together. So that's why lining up the marks of her brush strokes, if you will, is very important and actually vital to the sculpture itself. Am I a painter? Am I a sculptor? I don't know. I'm talking to the world while painting on it or with it or in it. Therefore, there is a collision of things with the painted image. Something comes about by this collision that can't be taken apart anymore. There is the plastic or sculptural thing. If I take it away, the painting isn't there anymore. And if I take my painting away, then this metamorphosis isn't there anymore. So these things kind of stick together, even though they're coming from two very distinctive worlds. It's not necessary to decide that you are a painter or a sculptor. It doesn't make your work more radical or more clear. I totally enjoy to look at things, and I want something cool to look at. So I make this for myself also a lot. I immensely enjoy when doing it, what comes out of it during the making. I amuse myself, you know, I entertain myself. But it has to be complex and fun and ridiculous and tricky. There, it's about tricks that I play to myself and to others. I'm the trickster, really, the painting trickster. Don't believe me, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> to learn more about art in the 21st century and its educational resources, please visit us online at pbs.org slash art21. Art in the 21st Century is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS.